Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ruth Shelley, president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. Every meeting I've opened with this year's theme that Rotary opens opportunities. Yes, Rotary opens opportunities to find solutions for today's challenges. Healing from the pandemic, recovery from the economic downturn, and peace building as we seek racial justice. Now this week, we focus on all three doors as Derek Olson, president of World Oregon, helps us understand how Oregon connects around the globe. Very appropriate for International Service Committee Month. But first, let's welcome Rotarian Birol Yesalata for our reflection. Birol? Thank you, President Ruth. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. Paul Harris once said, what a privilege it is to be linked with thousands of other Rotarians of different nations held together by a common ideal of service. In our 116 year history, Rotarians achieved remarkable goals to better life for humanity and kept service above self as their motto. International service remains one of those areas where our focus is going to be needed in the coming years, as this global pandemic has taken its toll on everyone, especially those in developing countries. Those countries are estimated to have lost 10 years of progress. But don't get discouraged. It only means we need to work harder. As one great thinker said, and I quote, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Albert Einstein, thank you for your continued service. And thank you for that reminder, Errol. We appreciate it. If any of you would like to volunteer to give the reflection, Siobhan has put the link in the chat or feel free to email her directly. Now, before we go on, I want to share some sad news that Rotarian Karen Stefanov passed away on January 31st from stage four brain cancer. Karen was a member for 30 years and active on many committees. In lieu of flowers, her family has requested that donations in her honor be made to Rotary Club of Portland and the Living Desert Zoo. Thank you for remembering Karen and her family at this sad time. Now I would like to ask that Rotarians who have invited a guest to raise their real or virtual hand, and Maria will call on you to unmute and introduce them. Or if you're a visiting Rotarian who came on your own, please raise your hand and introduce yourself or let us know of your presence via the chat box. Maria, do you see any guests today? I do, we have a guest from Rotarian, Danielle Banks, Danielle? Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Funda Kelsey. Funda is a Rotarian in the Hillsboro Club. And uh, Funda, if you'll wave at everyone and uh, just say hello, we'll know where you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. And that's who we have, President Ruth, back to you. Welcome and thank you all for attending our meeting. Now I'd like to extend a happy anniversary to everyone who joined Rotary Club of Portland in February. We alternate each week honoring birthdays and Rotary anniversaries for the month. Please note the names of these anniversary people and reach out to the, one of them with a call or an email since keeping up on our memberships during this challenging time is more important than ever. Congratulations to all of you celebrating anniversaries. And now please welcome Vice President Rotarian Reed Miller to give the final numbers for this year's trust drive. Reed? Thank you, President Ruth. Great to be here. Uh, good afternoon, Rotarians. It's with uh, great pleasure that I'll present today's numbers for you for the annual trust drive. This is our fundraising event that we do annually to raise all the money for our great committees that do all of the wonderful work in the community. So this is, uh, very exciting that we have uh, raised this money this year. We came to a grand total of $139,000 and 
Uh, very excited about that. I appreciate everybody who donated. Thank you so much for all your generous contributions. We just missed out on our 100% uh, goal. Uh, I do want to thank our anonymous donor who volunteered to uh, do a $5,000 match for our 100% goal. We did not achieve that, uh, but we did pretty well this year. I'm excited about the, uh, the turnout. So thank you everybody that contributed and look forward to uh, seeing what we can do next year. Thank you. Thank you, Reed, for your leadership of the trust drive and thanks to all of you who donated so generously. Now, please welcome Rotarian Brian Daisy to tell you about our International Services Committee, the Committee of the Month. Brian? Buenas tardes, fellow Rotarians. Good to see everybody again. My name is Brian Daisy and I've been an active member of the International Service Committee for almost four years. And in that time, I've made three trips to visit with several partners down in Guatemala. And today I'd like to highlight the relationship that we enjoy with the Rotary Club of Antigua, Guatemala. Like most relationships, they start, they grow, and finally mature to become much more than we hoped for when it began. The Antigua Club is not a large club, but they are involved in countless projects in their community Whereas you might guess the demand far surpasses the supply. Our club has a long history of working with the Antigua Club, primarily on educational projects. From the beginning, providing scholarships to local students has grown into a robust support for providing microcredit loans to women owned businesses and other projects. In response to the recent dev devastation uh, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Antigua Club recognized the immediate need for hardware to allow our scholarship students to continue on their paths toward graduation. The call went out for money to supply laptop computers to support remote learning. We were quickly able to provide some support along with several other clubs to keep the momentum that we've created for these students moving forward. As Rotarians, we're dedicated to serving others. One of the strengths of our club in Portland is the opportunity to give back as a member of one of our many committees. This spirit of helping others is in our blood up here in Portland, I guess. And I'm here to tell you, we don't have a monopoly on strong desire to help others. Through the language and cultural differences, the desire to serve others is alive and well within our partner clubs. That's the most important thing we look for when we form partnerships with Rotary Clubs around the world. One of the key components to a robust relationship with a Rotary Club in other countries is accountability. When we support scholarships in other countries, the clubs we partner with take our support very seriously and we all work very hard to make sure that the money we invest is well spent. We never support projects simply by wiring them money. No, no, we weave accountability into the funds that we commit and our partner clubs must share in this belief. Funds are committed with specific targets in place that we want to achieve. We verify our contributions to projects in partnerships with our international clubs. And it's a true win-win situation that benefits everybody. Kind of like the four-way test. I wanted to share a story about one of the families our scholarship contributions has helped. And if I've done this correctly, there should be a slide up on the screen. There it is, the top left picture. Now, how do I get back to my presentation? Sorry, guys. Oh, come on. It's here somewhere. Well, I guess I'm just gonna go from memory here. The family we're looking at, the young lady in the, the navy blue uh, zip up, her name is Stephanie Ordonez, and this is her family. And Stephanie has been a participant in the scholarship program for three or four years with us. Her family has had some hardships with uh, illnesses and Stephanie has relied on the scholarship that we provided. She has now graduated with a technical degree in, in drawing, mechanical drawing, and she hopes to go to architecture school. The young lady next to her is her younger sister, Louisa, who is also one of our newer scholarship recipients. 
And our scholarships are helping this family succeed toward education, which is the way that's going to lift them out of poverty. Stephanie now has a job working for an architectural firm. It's like a paid internship, but she's able to provide support for her family. And if you'll give me one minute, I do have to find my, there it is. I apologize. Another area we've developed in partnership with the Antigua Club is the introduction of a growing microcredit program. In concert with an NGO called Namaste and the Antigua Club, we contribute to a program designed to subsidize and support women to become self-sustaining in a culture where women without a husband do not enjoy equal treatment in the business world. Women apply to get into the program and once they're accepted, they need to successfully pass their training before they receive any funds. They're given a small cash loan to start their business per their business plan they've developed. How to separate family, uh, the women are taught how to account for both revenue and expenses and be assured that one of their expenses is loan repayment. They pay this money back. But they also learn how to separate family funds from business funds and how to create profit for their families. Upon sex successful completion of their business plan, they can reapply for a larger loan to grow their business in a responsible manner. And the NGO who facilitates this program has developed resources to document all of their business owners' progress. The women in this program learn how to manage their business by the numbers which has proven to be very successful and give great results. I'm amazed at how detailed the data is that they provide to track the money that our club and other clubs have invested. So in conclusion, I wanna thank all of you for your support of the International Service Committee and the work we do all over the globe. It's through the development of partner clubs all over the world, like the relationship we enjoy with the Antigua Club that our donations create true impact for others and stay true to our motto of service above self. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Brian. The photos really made it come to life. So enjoyable and such important work. Now we're going to disappear and enter a virtual table talk. Please introduce yourselves to the others in your group. A minute or so before you come back to this main meeting, you'll get a visual heads up. And because it's International Service Committee Month, may I suggest a topic for your discussion? What has been one of your favorite international trips and why? Here we go. And now on to our program. After our speaker today is finished, if you'd like to ask Derek a question, Maria will moderate the Q&A through the chat box. And now, please welcome past president and current assistant governor, Rotarian Chris Acterman as today's chair of the day. Chris? Okay, good afternoon. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Derek Olson. Um, I met Derek uh, when he was co-leader of an exchange group from Portland to Columbia. Um, and my wife and I had the opportunity to uh, tour Buddha Bogota, Medellin, and Cali um, with the larger group. And then with a small group that Derek organized, uh, we uh, went to several other places, including Cartagena. So that was my introduction to Derek and World Oregon. Um, <clears throat> Derek is a uh, graduate of Taggart High School and then ventured on to Dartmouth. And from Dartmouth, he spent um, 13 years, I believe, in the Foreign Service, working primarily in Latin America, and I think primarily in trade relations. Um, he then returned to Portland and was involved in a number of projects with uh, Business Oregon and Greater Portland, Inc., uh, involving um, international relations with the uh, business community in Oregon. And then since 2016 has been the director of, uh, I think what used to be the Foreign Affairs Council of Oregon is now World Oregon. So uh, he has a very long experience in the area of international relations uh, and also a very long experience in the area of Oregon's international relations with the world. 
So on that basis, I welcome uh, and look forward to hearing from Derek. Thanks so much, Chris, for that uh, introduction, very kind introduction. And thanks, Ruth and Siobhan, and for getting things organized for this uh, opportunity to, to join you. And I know several of you, uh, Beryl, Al, and Chris and Marielle and, and others who've had a chance to uh, to be friends and work with over the years. So it's wonderful to see everyone today. And, and again, thanks for this time. I'm going to keep my presentation on the shorter side because I really love the question and answer and the discussion. Um, and I'm going to kick off before I but dive into remarks by just playing a real short video um, that gives you, for some of you who are very familiar with the World Affairs Council of Oregon, which as Chris said, we rebranded to World Oregon a couple years ago. But for some of you, this may be the first time. So I'm going to play you this short three minute video um, that stars a couple of our former directors who you may recognize uh, and kind of give you a little sense of what we're about. So bear with me. I'm going to share my screen and my audio and one second here. So the world in 2020 is quite a different place than the world in 1950 when we were founded. In many respects, the world we're in in 2020 has a lot of the uncertainty and angst about the future as we did in 1950. And we've really been blessed as an organization to have incredible leaders on the board uh, and volunteers who have given so much of their time, talent, and treasure to make this happen. Well, the original uh, founder was really uh, Frank Monk, who was a professor of political science at Reed College. He was a Czech national and had been the director of the UN relief organization during World War II, uh, very much a man of the world. So this is uh, Frank Monk, who founded the World Affairs Council of Oregon. And because uh, of his initiative and because of America's generous welcome, to this refugee, uh, World Oregon is now celebrating its 70th anniversary. The council has evolved in lots of ways, but has always been very true to this core mission of connecting to the world. And I think the council done a very good job of not only being true to that mission, but reinterpreting it and making it relevant to the moment. My hope for the future of World Oregon is that it's able to continue fostering international education in all, all kinds of ways for, for Oregonians. Um, one, of course, is to continue the global classroom, helping teachers present the world to the students of Oregon. Another is to continue bringing international leaders to our state through the International Visitor Program. Of course, the, the monthly uh, speakers are excellent in the Young Adults Program that uh, gets young adults in, involved in talking about uh, international issues. So I look forward to uh, joining you all and continuing to be a participant in World Oregon, a member of World Oregon, as we pursue a world that is more productive and more peaceful. As we look back at our 70 years, we've trained some of the leaders of the future, we've hosted some of the leaders of the world, and we have become a key part of this community. And as we look towards our next 70 years, we're just excited about what that brings and how we can continue to evolve and stay engaged in a way that's relevant and meaningful and helps provide engagement on global affairs throughout the whole community. So hope you enjoyed that short video, it gives kind of an idea. Obviously this was filmed before the virus pandemic. Uh, looking back now, I mean, we, we finished that up literally, you know, a couple of weeks before things kind of uh, went to heck in a handbasket um, last year. And some of those statements were not meant to be a prophetic or ironic, but I, I realized that they sort of sound that way now. But I, I thought it would uh, give you a good chance to just get a sense of it. and. Um, Many of you may not realize that Jeff Merkley, our now uh, U.S. Senator, was a former president um, who was followed up by Wolf, who, who many of you I think have met. And um, Senator continues to be a strong supporter of the organization. And so even though we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, 
Um, you know, he uh, and other elected officials have been, you know, influential in in helping to connect us uh, with the community and to really emphasize um, how it is not a partisan issue to want to connect around the world. I'd say much like Rotary does. And um, I've had the uh, opportunity over the years to, um, you know, connect with Rotary, uh, both when I've lived overseas and locally, and, and I've always admired uh, what Rotary clubs have done with international exchanges. So, uh, and I've had conversations with District 5100 about, you know, coordinating on things like that, because as you see, and it, we do a fair amount of exchanges on youth. So just, um, Chris talked about who I was. I would just emphasize a couple things of note. First of all, it's great to see what you're doing in Antigua, Guatemala. Um, my first tour as a Foreign Service Officer for the State Department was as a consular officer uh, in Guatemala. And uh, this was back in the mid nineties. And um, I had a chance many times to go to Antigua, at, which is an incredible city and um, uh, both for fun and also sometimes when Americans <laughs> would do questionable things and get in trouble and they would need someone to come visit them. Uh, and uh, so Guatemala has a, you know, a warm spot in my heart and it's an incredible country with many challenges. And so it's wonderful to see you partnering with the club there. Um, as Chris uh, mentioned, uh, you know, since about, I've been back in Oregon uh, as, for about 15 years, but I've been with World Oregon specifically as its president since 2006. Um, and as the video explained, excuse me, 2016, and as the video explains, you know, the, the mission really of World Oregon is to connect our region and the people here with the world. Um, and we do that through three primary programs that kind of were touched on in the video. Uh, we have Global Classroom, which is all our work with K through 12, and that's both with teachers, we do teacher training. Um, we have a uh, culture boxes, which are both uh, hands-on items you can bring into the classroom from different cultures, like musical instruments, textiles, and games, but also virtual resources. And then we have um, youth leadership and training uh, called Young Leaders in Action. They do some amazing work. Last year, they produced a curriculum on uh, climate refugees, working with uh, school uh, non nonprofits that work on school curriculum. And so that's sort of the big area that we call Global Classroom, which is really kind of enrichment on international issues and um, uh, again, partnering with both public and private schools, um, especially throughout the uh, Portland metro area, but increasingly during the pandemic, and I'll talk a little bit about that, our virtual programs, we've been able to pro partner with schools around the state. So the second big area is the International Visitor Program. We partner with the US Department of State and again, where I used to, to serve uh, as, uh, as a foreign service officer to help bring in leaders from around the world. And so when I was overseas um, and uh, I served in Guatemala, Malaysia, Bolivia, and Honduras, as well as in and out of Washington, DC, I would often be a part of nominating you know, up and coming leaders you know, from labor unions or business groups or journalists or civic leaders and uh, they would be nominated to come to the U.S. on, a, on an exchange program. Uh, sometimes this would be English-speaking programs, sometimes it would be you know, Spanish-speaking with interpretation. And through the State Department, they go then to places around the U.S. and sister organizations of World Oregon. So there's a World Boston, and there's a Global Minnesota, and the World Affairs Council of Seattle. And depending on what their topic is, they go to different cities and they learn very often from people like you, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, uh, who have the ability to share um, their incredible professional experiences. We also have youth that come through the State Department exchange programs, um, and most of those are on leadership and service, similar to, I'd say, Rotary's values. And um, those are very intense, you know, couple week periods where they're staying with host families, and they're here usually uh, either during our summer break or during their summer break, which might you know be in our winter, depending on what part of the globe they're at. Um, and so that's their second biggest big area is international visitor program. And then what we're often known for, many of you have probably seen, is what we call global conversations, which is essentially our public programs and speakers. And so we just kicked off our international speaker series last Thursday, uh, where we had uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is uh, the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning 
author, uh, a writer, a journalist uh, who wrote the essay for the 1619 Project, which many of you probably heard of. There's been a lot in the news lately. So that was an incredible conversation uh, that I got to have along with one of our board members last Thursday with her for an hour or two um, for, our, for our members. Um, and then we, throughout the year, do all kinds of other um, programs. Uh, Bureau has spoken many times for us uh, on Turkey, on the EU, on other European issues. Uh, we do a partnership with the Foreign Policy Association, which is a New York think tank where we have a series called Great Decision, which I, I think some of you have joined in on, and that covers everything from trade to migration to the environment. And... Um, you know, and sort of transition on what this means in virtual is we've done all this now virtual. So like many organizations, we've done that, but we really dove in quickly, uh, you know, after we suspended and sent everybody home in March, we started March and really from April on consistently, um, we've had, you know, a couple webinars a week often uh, that are, some are free and just open to anyone. Others, we charge a nominal amount. Um, we are our young leaders meet virtually to do their leadership training. We actually now have international exchanges virtually where um, we'll have people zoom in from around the world to meet with you know professionals here in Portland to talk through that. And um, it's uh, you know been a I mean challenging transition I think like uh, any other uh, organization, but one that's been very um, you know, work pretty well with the support of the community. And we've both had, a, uh, I'd say the community has rallied to us to support us. And also I think people are more understanding of some of the, you know, quirks that happen and, and, and that everything doesn't have to be perfect. That the goal is to connect towards a more peaceful, prosperous world, as, as Senator Merkley was saying. The goal is not necessarily to have, um, you know, television quality events. <laughs> uh, so uh, while we sometimes achieve that, we, we, we shoot for a higher mark. And for those of you who've seen the International Speaker Series, we actually do work with a, uh, a local company called the AV Department who helps us really make it look kind of like television. Most of the rest of it is fairly informal because the goal, again, is that people-to-people -people connection uh, and really to have real dialogue and discussion. Um, you know, one other thing that we, we do as an organization that, that obviously we haven't done as much lately, but we're hoping to pick back up, you know, summer to fall, depending on, on vaccines, is international travel. Um, and so Chris mentioned, you know, had the privilege of, of, of leading a group uh, that was a, a subset of a, a large group from the Portland area that went on this best practices trip to Bogota and Medellin. And Chris and, and, and others, and we, we went and saw uh, other aspects of Colombia. Uh, we partnered through the World Affairs Councils of America uh, which has one of our sister organizations in Philadelphia, leads trips all over the world. So um, in fall uh, 2019, um, you know, a few months before the pandemic, I led a trip um, in uh, Spain and Portugal uh, called Trade, Trade Routes of Coastal Iberia, just really looking at um, the history of Spain and, and the Iberian Peninsula and connections to today. So obviously that's, you know, not something we're able to do right now, but we do do things like that virtually. So we've had international, um, uh, for instance, cooking classes and things like that. Um, I'll post in, in a minute when we get into the Q&A into the chat, like our YouTube channel, because I would encourage you to consider checking those out. Um, they're both, they range from, you know, the fun, making a, a national dish from the Dominican Republic to the very serious, talking about, you know, uh, uh, systemic racism, talking about uh, issues of uh, recovery from, from war and famine. And so we, we really, we are a generalist organization that allows us to tackle issues across the board, working with individual expert speakers or organizations who bring that kind of expertise. And it allows us to partner with everything from, you know, the J Japan American Society of Oregon to Portland State to, uh, you know, the Oregon Environmental Council. I mean, really, it runs the gamut uh, because there are so many issues nowadays that have a global local connection. I encourage you to consider, you know, thinking about how you can, can be engaged in that. Like, as I said, many, many of you have already been to some of our events or have hosted someone. Uh, it, we are always looking for people who have interest in hosting other professionals for virtual discussions or in the post-COVID times, in-person discussions. Um, one of the most rewarding things is when people host some of the youth in their in their house for uh, exchanges. I know it's very, uh, you know, similar to the commitment that uh, that Rotary members do when they host. 
But I would say the difference is, and why we don't really compete, where I'd say complementary to Rotary, is we have short-term exchanges. So our youth are usually here are for two weeks, um, maybe three weeks. Like we had one with three weeks where they were maybe uh, sometime with family and the rest of the time they were staying at a camp down, an OMSI camp down in, in Newport with some of our staff. Um, and the adults all stay in hotels. Maybe they would have a dinner at someone's house. Um, and so it's a different type of model of exchange as opposed to the long-term exchange, and which is fantastic. It's just a different approach. And so instead of having a student for you know one year going to school, they're usually here for a couple of weeks and, and, and sort of an intensive period. So I think it's something, especially as we coming out of, the, out of COVID with vaccines and things that, that you might want to consider um, you or, 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 or folks in your family who, who have kids, especially, um, it can be a really rich experience. Um, before I get to questions, I just say, lastly, um, the, what we try to do really, again, is, you know, I mentioned that we were talking about global issues. I mean, we try to enact our values and our mission through our programs. So while we will occasionally make statements, and especially when, you know, the terrible events of the world, you know, really call upon it, we, we, we have made statements about whether it's about combating systemic racism or the threat to democracy from the January 6th insurrection. And as a side note, I appreciate you taking time to listen to me rather than watching the impeachment hearings, which are ongoing right now. Um, you can decide later, which is more entertaining. Um, but uh, we are, you know, we're not an advocacy and a policy organization. We really are about implementing our mission. So we really try to show our values and uh, you know, just our openness and acceptance through our programs that we work with just a wide range of, uh, of groups and speakers and organizations um, that we really do believe that dialogue leads to a more peaceful world. And while again, like we occasionally make statements to that effect, we really try to show that through the work we do in the community. We're hoping again, this summer, fall, depending on the vaccine rollout, to be able to, to resume our in-person exchanges. It's actually fascinating. The State Department is grappling with that right now. There's some indications that maybe they would resume in June. I'm not sure if that's actually going to happen or not. Um, and so, uh, like I said, we're part of this national network, really, that that tries to um, show you know little parts of America to the world uh, in, working in collaboration. So. Again, I think I'm going to wrap up there and then jump into questions. And we're starting to get questions, and I'd love to, to get some more to talk about that, and I uh, both about what we do, but also about some of the uh, issues that we'll we'll tackle here soon. I would note that we'll soon we're having as part of our international speaker series an OHSU uh, infectious disease expert speaking with a, a public health journalist on what's what's next in COVID-19. Uh, we're having Tom Colicchio, um, from the lead judge from uh, Top Chef, which just filmed in Portland. You may have seen some of the press coverage of that. He does a lot of work on hunger and combating uh, food insecurity, similar to um, uh, what some of the other uh, Chef Jose Andres and other of the celebrity chefs deal. We're going to have him speak for us. So we really try to find a nexus between the local and the international, and, and we hope that you help meet us there. And now I'll dive into questions. Thank you, Derek. So maybe I'll Wonderful. I have a few folks in the queue, so I'm going to call on each Rotarian. As a reminder, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your electronic blue hand or just send me a direct message that says, hey, Maria, I got a question. Uh, so I have a queue already started. We're going to start with Rotarian Chris Acterman. Chris? So um, we have a very robust and diverse um, immigrant community. And um, I wondered uh, how much interaction you're doing with them in terms of establishing connections and things like that. No, great question, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the most exciting things to me as I you know, grew up in, uh, in the Portland area and then basically was 20 years outside of Oregon, going to college, living overseas, et cetera. And they came back is to see you know, how much uh, Portland is diversified and all the incredible, uh, uh, you know, uh, vibrant life that that is, is injected into our larger community. Um, we partnered with many um, community organizations, um, both for immigrants and refugees. And so sometimes that's through nonprofits that work to help resettle refugees. We've done programs on that. We've also uh, have connected international visitors with um, diaspora community 
piece. Um, and that's always really interesting when we get, you know, say groups from Ukraine here who meet with Ukrainian Americans who have immigrated here and to be able to have discussions. It can be very interesting to have uh, those uh, interactions. Um, it's something I think we need to always continue to be focused on because as Tim, our program director has mentioned, sometimes the best expert is not necessarily, you know, someone in DC talking about what's going on with a community, but, you know, someone right here who immigrated and has that experience of living over in a different country, living in the Portland area, what are some of the what are the good points, what are the challenges, and then having them share that. And so that's something I think we can always strive to do more is to have, have more uh, uh, community leaders be part of, part of our experts and, and discussions uh, with our members. Thank you, Derek. Our next question comes from our guest for today, who maybe is a potential future Rotarian, but our guest, Funda Kelsey. Funda? Hello again, um, thank you. Um, Derek, I remember seeing your country education kits at uh, Multnomah Athletic Club during one of your international events. I was impressed how many artifacts you had on Turkey. Is there any way we could donate items in our possession to support this program? Thank you. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, I, I swear I didn't tee that one up, but, but because we actually do have, and I'll post here in a little bit in the chat maybe when we go to the next part of the meeting, uh, if, uh, we actually have a suggested guidelines of the type of things we're looking for. And there are actually specific countries that often that we will advertise that we are short on reality as, uh, as a new term I learned from ed the educators among you probably, probably know that, but you know, these hands-on materials. Uh, so, so absolutely yes. Um, and then what we've done in the pandemic is, you know, we have a hundred plus of these, you know, boxes that teachers can check out and bring into the classroom. In the pandemic, we've created online supplementary versions of that that have curated lists of videos and some books and things like that so that a teacher or a parent can safely go and click on this and, uh, you know, and have uh, some key materials to help support that. So one of the ways it's really become most vibrant is, is people like you helping, helping to us to keep it current and have um, things that really uh, kids, especially in the younger grades, really just it brings it to life in a way that something else can't. Thank you, Derek. Our next question comes from Rotarian Scott Burns. Scott? Derek, absolutely interesting talk. Thank you very much. My question is, how did you get an interest in international affairs? Was it something at Tiger High School? Was it something at Dartmouth? Uh, where along the lines did you take an interest in outside of Tiger? Sure. Well, I was fortunate uh, in that my dad uh, is a now retired OHSU professor, and he did a sabbatical in England uh, in the early 80s, and our whole family uh, went, and so I had the opportunity to live in England and go to a British grammar school, and that really just opened my eyes, and we got a chance to travel and, you know, make friends, and ever since then, really, it, um, it, this was junior high age for me, uh, dating myself since they're now, I guess they're all middle schools at this point. Um, but uh, uh, that really got, got it into my system and I've been ever interested ever since. And so I tried to study that more and then and in college specifically. And then I was so focused on it that I went to graduate school afterwards at Georgetown, specifically on international affairs and basically just been working on international ever since. And so I... I, I because I know I was fortunate in having that opportunity, I try to meet with up and coming young students and share thoughts and tidbits and suggestions. In fact, I met yesterday virtually with a Linfield uh, University a student who uh, was very interested in also pursuing an international career and they're halfway through their college experience. And so I always try to share that back um, because I know that I had that experience that was unique, um, you know, somewhat akin to the kind of experience that you give to kids when they do uh, rotary study abroad uh, experiences. It really, it changes your world. Thank you. Our next question comes from Rotarian Daniil Banks. Daniil? Yes. Um, hi, Derek, again. I can't resist asking, you know, given all of the places that you've been around the world, I know it would be hard to choose one where you had a, an especially unique or unusual experience, but could you perhaps share uh, one or two of your adventures uh, with us? Wow, sure. Uh, well, you know, I was uh, 
in the State Department, I was fortunate to spend a lot of my time in Latin America with our family. And so our whole family, you know, as part of that, both in the training and then growing up there, learned Spanish and really had a chance to have just an incredibly rich experience um, where, uh, you know, we really were part of, uh, you know, got to, to learn and, and be part of those different uh, communities. Um, which, as someone mentioned, I think, you know, in, in one of the chats earlier is, is quite a different experience than from going on with like a short business trip. And so I've had those experiences of several years in a country, uh, you know, when you're speaking the local language, when you're really, um, especially before the internet, um, and when you're in time zones away, it's really quite um, detached from, from your whatever experience was your sort of growing up experience. And then to sort of compare and contrast that with when I've uh, the, the type of uh, travel I've done since coming back to Oregon, which tended to, to tended to be more shorter business trips and has been more focused on Europe and Asia, because that is really where a lot of the connections for trade and investment are in Oregon, more so than Latin America. So they're very different types of experiences, which is why it was so much fun for me to go back with Chris and others to Colombia, because when I, it was my first time going back to um, a Latin American uh, developing country um uh you know since having lived for, for years and years there and um and what was striking to me and i'm sure you've seen this when you have uh go on rotary trips is for a lot of americans they've, they've never been um ha had that experience um to, in a developing country and it's so important i think to have the perspective of learning from them not just trying to you know share and teach but also to learn from from people in 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 whatever country that you're visiting and to have a, a sense of humility and understand that, um, you know, for a lot of parts of the world, there's some um, challenges that, that, you know, the United States may not even think about that a lot of countries are still grappling with on, on a regular basis. And so uh, uh, to me, that was interesting to sort of combine and some of my previous life where I was living and, and then shorter trips and, and have that come together on the, on the trip to Columbia was really fascinating to, to have those uh, sort of come, in, come into one. And so if you haven't ever lived overseas, you know, and you get that chance, it really is, as, as, you know, Augustine was saying in our chat, I mean, it is a different type of experience than just visiting from a short period. And, and to me, then I think it then it riches when you go back on a short visit, because you, you have a different approach to being in, in a different country. Thank you, Derek. We have time for one last question that's coming from Rotarian Reem Gunam. Reem? Thank you. Um, Derek, I'm interested in learning why is it important for Oregon to be um, aware of world uh, issues and affairs uh, when it is um, a state in the US? Um, why is that important understanding and, and expanding that perspective for Oregonians? Sure. Well, to me, I think it's increasingly true that almost any core issue has both a local and a global connection. So when we were talking about uh, with Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, and you talk about an issue like Black Lives Matter, I mean, that protest movement in the United States sponsored protest movements throughout the world. And you can see those connections directly. So, you know, in Belgium, maybe it was toppling a colonial statue, whereas here in the United States, it's toppling a Confederate statue. And I, I think sometimes uh, people don't see the connections, but for us and our team, we, we very much see that. And um, despite all the challenges the United States has had uh, over the last several years, I mean, people around the world look to U.S. and in many cases, specifically to Oregon and the greater Portland metro area uh, because of our leadership in things like environmental issues and, and urban planning and incredible, you know, uh, you know, entrepreneurism and issues like that. And so I think it's both beneficial to our community and then also as a responsibility to share and to exchange ideas. And so we always want, I think we always benefit by having that exchange and the knowledge sharing. And um, it's just really a privilege to be able to do that. And, and again, I, I thank you for the time here today because I think Rotary, you are uh, an ally in this effort to uh, you know, create a more peaceful world through, through knowledge and exchange. And um, you know, it's, it's the long game. And, um, but it's a very important one and we will continue uh, along with our sister organizations throughout the US. Derek, thank you. And thanks to all of you for such great questions. Next week, February 16th, we'll hear from Tyler Termier, CEO of Cascades AIDS Project. This meeting will once again be live via Zoom at noon on Tuesday. 
but please look two weeks ahead and mark your calendars to attend the following week on February 23rd, when we're going to be electing our new club board members and we really need a quorum. This is a wonderful time to extend an invitation to someone you haven't seen at a meeting and have them come so that we can collect their vote. And now I want to thank our virtual guest today, Funda. We're so glad you joined us. Thank you for your question. Birol unfortunately had to leave us, but we're grateful for his reflection. Reed, thank you for your leadership on the trust drive and those wonderful, generous results. Brian, thank you for your insight into our International Service Committee and with such a well-crafted presentation. Chris, we appreciate your speaker introduction. And again, Derek, thank you so much for your informative presentation. It's so relevant and kind of ironic that as we feel somewhat isolated these days, it's because of a global pandemic. Rotarians know that we're all truly connected. As we enter into a new Rotary Week, please join me in opening the doors of opportunity for healing, recovery, and peace building. As Rotarians, we're here to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and with justice for all. Have a good week, everyone, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>